Alright, what's going on y'all? You are watching Revolt TV. I am Dev T. Smith. We are back again for another open discussion on Facebook Live. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the fashion industry and its very slow progression towards diversity. Um, obviously, branching off our last discussion that we had, we know that um, the influence of, uh, of uh, people of color um, is very heavy in pop culture, right? And that's definitely the case within fashion. Um, but we don't necessarily, we're not used to seeing a equal representation in terms of uh, appearance on runways, print ads, um, and just the overall uh, front-facing look of what fashion means to the world. Um, up until now, we're just getting to a point where we're actually seeing an increase in representation. Um, close to 30% of, um, of casting for uh, Fashion Week um, has been people of color, which is an increase. They've never seen that, like, ever. Um, that's actually the first increase in two years, but this is the first time that it's been this big. You're seeing a shift happening where uh, there's equal representation across the board. Um, one thing that we always talk about when it comes to fashion is, of course, uh, cultural appropriation. Um, a lot of times the styles and the trends and the fads that are, that are you know, kind of taken and run with are made by people who look like us and we are kind of taken out of the conversation once that goes public and there's like money to be made off of it. When it comes to fashion um, and the exposure that we're getting today um, and in, in context to cultural appropriation exposure, we can't exactly be happy about the increase in exposure if it doesn't come with some type of leverage and or equity um, in this space. Um, and I think that's where the sore spot is about cultural appropriation. It's like you're you're intentionally taking something from us, applying it someplace else, and then spitting it out, selling it to your folks, and then selling it back to us. It is insulting um, to, you know, to the customer, um, to someone's intelligence, um, to lovers of fashion, um, and, you know, just to the historical context of, you know, our ability to shift culture overall. Um, and so that's kind of where I stand on that. But to harp a little bit on like last year's, um, last year's Fashion Week with Marc Jacobs and the, uh, the locks that went down the runway was very controversial, right? So we talk about hairstyles and hairstyles are particularly a point of interest right now especially with black women where it, whereas we are being more widely celebrated for being natural and embracing natural um, and promoting that and to see a, a brand like Marc Jacobs uh, make a statement like that and then he yeah, adds insult to injury by saying you know I don't see color I you know I see people I see this I see that um, and then to try and make good on what happened by creating a collection that is hip-hop inspired is as if to say hip-hop is all of black culture and it's not it's just a portion of black culture i understand designers are always drawing inspiration from things that are not in their immediate world that's just how it is being a creative you know you're gonna go outside what you know is your norm and you know try to borrow uh, but i think it has to be done with you know respect and understanding and there being um some sort of involvement with us on the other end you know just don't just take 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 and you know necessarily you know not necessarily give back the credit I think that's important as well like involving people who have some sort of historical context to go with it i.e. African Americans if you're gonna do the baby hairs if you're gonna do the dreadlocks like let's have like an actual discussion or involve you know black stylists and black models um, and, and, and it be authentic and not be something that's being taken because um, I understand, you know, we are inspirational people. We're like the most like influential people on the planet. So of course people are going to be inspired by us. But I think that if it's done with respect and understanding, then, um, you know, it's not feeling like it's there's some theft behind it. Because even when you look at like Kendall Jenner and like the Pepsi commercial, like, you know, they were trying to make protesting trendy. And it's like, okay, well, like, this is a serious matter we're talking about. And there, it didn't seem like there was a conversation to follow the commercial. Are we donating some of the proceeds to ACLU? Like, are we donating some of these proceeds to Black Lives Matter? Or are we just taking it just to make a trendy commercial because protesting is in right now, you know? So I think definitely keeping um, authenticity behind it is like a major um, point for me. The truth is the 
consumer who's buying the hot fashion doesn't want to see the people in their natural habitat on the runway. It's just that simple. The creatives who's actually making the fashion, Ricardo Tisci loves all people, especially black people. Mar Jacobs, he gave Kanye his first chance to make a real hip hop s shoe for other races to buy. But the average consumer doesn't want to see the real people who actually made the fad on the runway. And that's why they're creatively making it and having all these parent companies fund it. If it was really just for us, by us, like a FUBU moment, like they would downgrade it and treat it like it wasn't the highest level, even though we're the ones who manufacturing the sauce and we live it the best. And the worst part is at times when they give certain black chances, they get people who've studied it too much rather than lived it. The girl who's in Harlem who's just wearing Air Maxes because her boyfriend wears them or her mother told her that that's a good shoe to wear when you're not wearing heels and she looks great in it and a girl wants to copy her, that's just her natural environment. Now, another person might see that and say, man, I'm scared of that person, but I love that look. And then a creative person says, well, I gotta pay my bills. I have to stay the creative director of said fashion house. So I'm gonna go get Gigi Hadid to wear this two-piece suit instead of getting, you know, um, Shanae or, you know, whoever to go do, you know, you know, sad thing. So it's just about us really letting them know that you can love our culture because we want you to love it, but you also have to celebrate us in that moment and get the real deal. And that's why every time, you know, we do see those real moments, we all smile on the inside, but we need a lot more of those to be prevalent. When we have the highest form and control, a la Michael Jordan, I think he's the best example of someone who completely controlled like how they looked and completely solidified himself within like culture. Like Jordan is not Nike no more. Jordan is Jordan, you know? Sometimes if we just like read the entire story or if like if the media covers the entire story, um, we will learn that like not all cases are these cases. And um, but at the same time, it's, it, it's hard to tell people to kind of do their own research when there's so many examples of us being appropriated. I also think we've come to a point where the lines are so blurred that like we find anything that's like resembles appropriation and then we just label it. So even with the Mark Jab um, Jacobs example, um, the story was just told that Jacobs had like white women, super pale white women with dreads on the runway. but. The part of the story that was left out was that the because the, the hair was colored it was like pink white whatever it's like one of his best friends i forget the young lady she's like a fashion lady she's like a pretty big deal and that's her like she walks around with she just has been her look for like years so he was literally looking at his friend like oh i think you look ill so when he says the oh i don't see color and whatever and we looked at that as just like a press release or like a pr like statement it might have been a legitimate statement, whereas he might not have even thought past looking at his friends. You know, where do we draw the line at something being, you know, intellectual property? Um, and the example that we're going to use is uh, Dapper Dan versus Gucci. Um, if you want to take this one away and kind of, you know, shed light on that situation. I speak to Dapper Dan a lot. Uh, shout out to the homie. Um, I can't really like go into the Jedi uh, training that he put me into, but recently Beyonce wore the Dapper Dan piece. You know, and in a sense, that is Beyonce more or less bringing the conversation forward. Like, look, even though he made it, I am going to claim some ownership on it. But the real problem is this. It's nothing wrong with him designing it. The, the problem stems deeper than that. Why not actually bring Dapper Dan in to get his, you know, to get his exact measurements, collaborate with him. The same way you collaborated with, well, the same way Louis Vuitton collaborated with Steven Sprouse years ago. The same way Gucci just collaborated with Gucci Ghost. Give him access to resources. You know what I mean? That guy, yeah. the guy Gucci Ghost does not have the same history that Dapper Dan does. Dapper Dan is a god amongst men when it comes to tailoring and designing and cutting and sewing. All patterns, whether you want it custom or you want it what you couldn't afford or couldn't have, but or you just wanted to be treated right Why you actually buy it. Because it was people who could afford the real Gucci and Louis Vuitton just wanted to go to someone where everybody knows your name, you know? Just wanted to go somewhere comfortable. And that's really what that situation is more about. And it's up for us to educate the younger kids and the older people as well to like not be so harsh and not to be so brash about it but understand it's not about what you do it's about how you do it you know because appropriation is going to happen if you're doing something naturally if you're naturally being cam and if someone wants to profit off of it 
you, you know, you're not going to try to profit off yourself, more or less. You're only going to want to do that after the fact when someone's shown you that something you're doing has a greater spectrum to it. Outlets try to present a product as if it's like brand new. Um, I think like the the bonnet, silk bonnet. Like I think like one of the style magazines put that out. Yeah, do rags. Um, even the dashiki trend. You know, like the new trending piece is dashikis. Like I don't like that I'm either. Come clean. That had me hot. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I don't like when they do that because then that really makes me mad because it's like okay, you're trying to present something that we definitely created a minute ago as something new. That to me is like the ultimate um, form of disrespect. Um, and I just think that the, the verbiage could be so much better. Like if you know, if you think dashikis are trendy, don't present them as like, this is like a new thing. Like talk about the history behind it. Like give us some context. If a do-rag is a phenomenon in a certain era for, for just blacks or just culture, it should be recorded and everyone should know these things. Right. It shouldn't be something that is only within our you know, our mother's mother gotta be able to tell someone. You know why? Because the average Katie or Madison who's working for Condé Nast know doesn't know. That. So when they get exposed to it, they're automatically taking us backwards and you're gonna read it and you're gonna be like, what in the, am I watching, you know? Or what am I reading? You're talking about major fashion houses that have been around for hundreds of years that quite honestly don't feel like they have to do anything to, to appease any market, any crowd, anybody who's, you know what I mean? They, they are like, the elite of fashion and and it's and it's uh it's heritage it's not you know what i'm saying like it's not just like going yeah it's not about like going to gap or something like that like these are these are fashion houses that have been in existence for a long time this is this is a, this is a heritage thing they don't really they're not gonna sit there and say you know what kanye you right you right bro we gotta we gotta we gotta do some deals with y'all they're not they don't they don't care about that kanye to us and i'm just using him as a reference for you the Con kanye to us they not looking at him like that you know what i mean like that's that's the upper echelon level of creativity and, and execution that we're looking at and we're fans of it when you see it have an influencer like that who is the only person that can make enough noise to say like yo the way that they're going about this is wrong you have to think about who he's talking to right they don't care <laughs> you know what i'm saying so i think when it comes down to it like it's we have to look at buying power and we have to look at influence on a monetary level. I said this a million times, this is a known fact, our buying power for black America is going to be one, like 1.4 trillion by 2020, right? So, but it's going to take, like this, this, this whole thing is all about like, it's going to take generations of understanding. Like he said, like passing knowledge down has to be incorporated into schooling. And you have to look at education. Like they're not gonna be like, you know what? Yeah, we should, we should teach these kids about do-rags. They don't give a shit. You know what I mean? They're not gonna do that. So it's really about, it's a community thing. We have to create a space where we're gonna have these types of conversations. One of the ways to, to, to really change how an industry is um, moving is to get people in those doors to kind of make those decisions. But if the kids aren't qualified enough to become designers at Gucci, or if they're not qualified enough to become um, power players in any of these these, these, these companies, then our, the narrative is gonna stay the same because it's the same people who are making the same decisions, right? So until we like start actually getting in these offices and, 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 and getting in positions of power to really start influencing from the back end, um, I think we're gonna have these conversations forever. So I think one of the, the focal points should be just educating our youth, educating the next designers, the next the cre next creative creatives, and let them know, okay, you might have ideas and you might have swag and style, but learn the business aspect of it so you can actually get in these, because we all, I'm pretty sure everybody in this office can, can name a bunch of cool, creative people that we know that can make a change in any of these industries. But like, are they in the position to make those? So we know we're out here, we know we can, do these things we can get the job done and we can make the change but let's just get us in the position of, of, of making the moves mm. in order for that change to really come about